الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه يجمعين أما بعد We'll pick back up regarding our mother Umm Al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha and we'll begin today with a very controversial issue which is her age at the time of her marriage and Alhamdulillah, we as Muslims have no shyness or no issue addressing this issue. Islamophobes think this is like some kind of like a silver bullet that they have because they can't get us on aqidah. Like in our belief, they have nothing. They can't, like you know how the Trinity doesn't make sense and they're like, it's a mystery and then they themselves say it doesn't make sense. So when we ask them about their belief, their creedal issues, they have no response. When we show them clear contradictions in the Bible and we see the, the preservation of the Bible clearly shot, they have no response. So the only thing they ever come back with is this age of Aisha radiyan. The first thing I want to mention, and this is, I'm addressing my Muslim brothers and sisters, it's not like I'm not doing this for like an apologetic or anything like that. Yeah? The age of Aisha radiyan, huh, to be clear, is not an aqidah issue. Just for us to be clear, this is not a creedal issue. In fact, it is not mentioned in the Qur'an, nor is it mentioned marfu'an from Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam. Yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam did not tell us in any hadith that is marfu' yani from the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, what was the age of Aisha radiyana at the time of his marriage to her. This is an issue that has been explained by her herself, Aisha radiyana, yani mawqufan, sahih, authentic, but mawquf, yani going up to a sahabi. So, from the aspect of tarikh, from the aspect of history, we discuss this issue. Not from an aspect of aqidah, nor from an aspect of fiqh. This is one of the mistakes, jazakallah khair. Many of our brothers make, Allah give you Jannat al Firdaus al Ala, I needed this. Now. Many of our brothers make this mistake where they think we take the fiqh of when you can get married from the hadith of Aisha radiyanha. And even though this hadith is mentioned in the kutub of fiqh, but as Al-Mughni expands from Muwafaquddin ibn Qudama or al nabawi in Majmu'ah, yani Shar al muhandab that the age of marriage is determined by physical and then later on the kutub of fiqh discuss mental capacity. Yani a woman could be of an older age, but in her environment, she is physically and mentally not ready to get married to a later age. Maybe 16, maybe 18. Wallahu alam. Some areas, women are ready for marriage at a very young age. Imam al-Shafi'i, one of the great scholars of Islam, he said in his time, he saw the women of Yemen, that they used to be menstruating and being ready for marriage at the age of 9. And this is in his time, he documented this, right? Now of course, in the US, maybe it's different. In Europe, it may be different. In Africa, it may be different. Islam is a religion that is applicable at all times and all places till the day of judgment. So we say you have to look at physical and mental maturity. Now, if we were to make an arbitrary age in the Sharia, if we were to say you cannot get married until you're 18. Now, that might work in our time, but that wouldn't work a thousand years ago. It wouldn't work in Europe, it wouldn't work in the Middle East, it wouldn't work in Africa, it wouldn't work in the Americas. So that would be a, a, a limitation that you would set that would not be universal. And that is why if we were to judge earlier times by standards set in our time, this is called presentism. Where we take the present and we judge the past by it. And that would not work in any culture. I'm going to give you an example because I want to be clear for those who try to يعني, try to put ta'an, try to put accusations against Islam. When we look at the age of Mary, Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, according to the Catholic encyclopedia, she was around 12 years of age. And, of course, and this is not Muslim research, we're not here presenting our view. Look it up. And it's not just from them. They present the early church fathers in their writings. 
And, and inshallah, I mean, there's a video we've already made that we've presented a lot of these. And I can inshallah list all those church fathers and the early Greek writings and everything, whoever wants it. They mention Joseph to be around 90 years of age. Okay? And this is not just the Catholics. If you look at the infancy uh, gospel of James, you will find that church fathers had mentioned that her age to be from 12 to 14 and Joseph 80 to 90. Now, I was reading a Christian apologetics article on this and he also, he presented the church fathers from the earliest time that gave these ages. And then he said, well, we can't judge that because that was a different time. And according to Jewish tradition, that is the tradition of the time that women could get married at 12 and they would marry men that are 90. Okay. And again, if a Christian comes back and says, well, that's not in the Bible. Well, the age of Aisha is not in the Quran. Yeah? You're giving historic documentation then we will accept your historic documentation as well. So when you give that, then they say, well, you can't judge that time because that was the tradition of the time. Okay, no problem. But a 90 year old or even an 80 year old marrying a 12 year old or a 14 year old today would definitely not be acceptable. So why is it that they become blind to their own traditions? In fact, till very recently, if you look at uh, the uh, marriage, for example, King Richard II of England, and this is 1377 to 1399. So this is not talking about 1400 years ago. This is very recent. He was married to Isabel, who was the, at the age of six. And then they may come back and say, well, they waited until a later age to consummate the marriage. No problem. Same thing with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi In fact, King John, who died in 1216, again, more recent kings, he was married to another Isabella, not the same one, and she was 12. So when we look at the, the, the Countess of uh, Essex uh, from Oxford, she, she was betrothed, she was given in marriage at 3 and married at 12. And this is recently. Now every historian that I looked up said, well that was the tradition of the kings of the time. Okay, no problem. But then you have to keep the same principle in mind. Aisha Taradianha, her marriage and her age is something that the first thing we have to look at is cultural norms of the time. Was she already engaged to be married? Yes. In fact, uh, Jubair ibn Mut'im ibn Adi, a mushrik, a kafir, because this is in the early time, he had already proposed and she was already engaged to be married. That is a fact. You can look up any book of Islamic history from Bidayah wa Nihaya to Siyar Alam al Nubala to Tariq ibn Sa'ad and others, Tabari, they will mention this. So when Rasulullah was suggested, he was not looking to marry Aisha. It's not like he saw her and wanted to go. No, this was something, Khwaila bint Hakim, as we mentioned in the earlier darts, she came with two names to Rasulullah. One of them being Aisha and one of them being Sauda. And she said, these are women that are of marriage. I mean, they are at an age appropriate for marriage. One of them has never been married. That is Aisha bint Abi Bakr. And one of them has already been married, which is Sauda uh, bint Zama. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa even at that time, he told her, go speak to the families. And he married Sauda first. And when the, the marriage proposal engagement was done with Aisha radiyanha in the Sahih Hadith, and we have no doubt to the authenticity of the Hadith. Some people misunderstand what I say. They say, oh, he made da'af for Hadith in Bukhari. La. No doubt to the Sanad of it, no doubt to it. The Matan of it, no doubt to it. Aisha radiyanha said that the proposal of Rasulullah sallallahu came to me at the time that I was six, and I consummated at the time of nine. But another hadith in Sahih Muslim, and again, no doubt to the Sanad of it, she said seven. And it's not something I'm rewriting here in, in order for da'wah, no. Imam al nabawi in the Sharh Sahih Muslim, he discusses that there is a discrepancy, and he's one of the opinions he gives, maybe she was a little bit older than six, close to seven, and so on. Meaning that these are not things that they were sure about. Right? Aisha radiyana, no doubt to her reliance in hadith, she's no doubt. But she's not reporting something she saw. It's not something she heard. She's giving a, a time frame of what was told to her. Without a calendar, without dates, without so on. Even her death age, there is khilaf ulema on this issue. 
If we take those ages to be there, then the marriage was consummated at nine, and as Imam Shafi'i said, that was the norm even at his time. Right? Now, there are other opinions. Ibn Sa'ad has given certain historic events that happened. I'm not relying on those, but I'm just opening up to the fact that this is not something that there was any issues upon to discuss. And he gave different ages. Others like Ibn Hajar and others, they said, no, this is well known amongst the ulema of Islam. What we know is that she was married at an age that was in acceptance to the norms of the time. The exact age, if she gave two ages between the years, then obviously this is open for discussion. But she was, even the, the actual consummation was delayed until she was physically able to be in a state of marriage. Okay. So, biologically and naturally and culturally, this was the correct age of marriage. When the proposal of Rasulullah was brought by Khawaila to the wife of Abu Bakr, عنه, which is Umm Roman, she said, let me speak to my husband, because he is the authority, he is the husband, he is the leader of the household, and he has already given her hand in marriage to somebody else. When the news came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr radiallahu he went to the father of the one who was to marry her, which is Mut'im. Mut'im ibn Adi was a mushrik. But yani, he was known for being a powerful and honored person. His son Jubair was the one to be married. When Abu Bakr radiallahu went, because Abu Bakr radiallahu never went against his word. And he was a man of his word. When he went, he didn't go and tell him, I'm breaking it off. No, because once you gave your word, he gave his word. But when he went to Al-Mut'im, Mut'im, he mocked Abu Bakr radiallahu And he said, it seems like you're going to try to make my son uh, a sabi. Yani those that leave the religion. You know, These were words that were used by the mushrikeen against the Muslims. Like today, if somebody wants to be in the Quran and Sunnah, what is, the, what is everybody, what are they going to say? You're Wahhabi. <laughs> I don't know what a Wahhabi is, it's just a title, you know, Wahhabi. Yeah, you stick to the Quran and Sunnah, Wahhabi. And not, not, uh, our Aqeedah didn't begin with Muhammad al Wahhab. Our Aqeedah is from the Quran, from the Sahih Hadith, the Aqeedah of Abu Hanifa, the Aqeedah of Shafi'i, the Aqeedah of Malik, the Aqeedah of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Aqeedah of the great Imma and Ulema after that. Yani, but when you talk about that, when you talk about how Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi for example, or a Shafi'i or Malik or Ahmad said about Istawa, or what they said about the Sifat of Allah, immediately you're Wahhabi. <laughs> so it's the same thing that they, that they would do at the time. They would make up these names and they would try to throw them on you. So he mocked Abu Bakr radiyan, meaning that you're going to try to take my son away from the religion of the, of, yani, what they had, the religion of their forefathers, and you're going to try to make him a Muslim. Abu Bakr radiyan told him, look, this is, if this is how you feel, then khalas. We don't need to move forward. And it broke off as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordained it. And at the great happiness of Abu Bakr radiyanhu, yani parental consent. When you talk about Western ideology, then this is something that we call parental consent. They went. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he particularly asked that Aisha radiyanha should be asked. Yani she should be asked if she is happy with that marriage. And with her happiness and her consent, the marriage moved forward. Now, when we talk about the marriage of Aisha radiyanha, the mehr that was given in the marriage of Aisha radiyanha was 500 dirham. 500 dirham, I just wanted to, for myself and for brothers and sisters here, wanted to calculate how much would that come out to be in our time. So the Islamic dirham, would be around 2.975 grams of silver, meaning that each one of them would be around $2.33 in our time. Multiplying that by 500, I came to $1,165. $1,165 was the mahr given by Rasulullah sallallahu for Aisha radiyana. Now again, that's not a wujuban. It's not obligatory that you have to give that. Mahar can be less, it can be more. But if you want to try to get an idea, subhanAllah, I mean, I just did this calculation. My own mahar when I got married was $1,000. Uh, sometimes we see in our time uh, an extreme in this on both sides. I have conducted a nikah here in this masjid where the mahar was a ring pop. You know, ring pop. 
that little candy, the little ring with the candy on it, right? <laughs> I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, right? If you cannot afford, okay, khalas. You don't even, a woman can give up her right to mahab. Yani some of the Sahaba, they gave izar, they gave half a izar, they gave iron rings, they taught Quran as mahar. Yeah. But if you are capable, then there should be some mahar to show the seriousness of what you're getting into. We also see some people, na'udhu billah, yani the mahar is a million dollars. I spoke to a person once who told me about a mahar that was a million dollars and how they were going to cut it down to 500,000. Uh, yani insane amounts, $100,000. Yani these are amounts that are unnecessary. That doesn't make any kind of sense. And yani it puts a burden on the, on the ummah that then brings problems. Either then they can't get married. There are entire countries today that are having a very hard time where people can't get married because just for social pressure, they've made the mahar so high. And this, this is, I have to address these issues because the ummah is facing these issues. I'm not going to give a talk here just to entertain you. We have, in our durus, we have to address the issues of the ummah. I know a brother personally. He went to go get married from a country. I won't mention the name of the country. Really, I won't. I'm tempted, but I won't. And I know this brother personally. And they said there is a girl, and she's very pious, mashallah, munaqqiba. She's memorized the Quran. She memorized a hadith. He was very happy. He went to the family. He spoke to them, mashallah, they seemed like a religious family. They told him, what are you from? The US, this and that. But he was born in the same country, even though he wasn't, or maybe he wasn't born there, but he's from, ethnically from there. And they told him, okay, do you want to see her? And he's from the sunnah, you can see the woman within boundaries. He said yes, and he saw her, everything good. She asked him about his tahajjud and mashallah, and she seemed good. The father said, okay, everything's good. We like you, you like us, 100 grand. Like 100 grand? It's like, well, I'm from the US, I didn't rob a bank. Ken. What do you mean 100 grand? And he's like, okay, no problem. If you can't afford it, I got another daughter. Not as good looking. <laughs> didn't memorize as much Quran. He said, you know, I thought I sold cars, but look at you, you're selling daughters. It's like a used any car salesman type of pitch. Oh, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Now in the Ummah, in some of these countries, there are women that are 30 and 40 and the only reason they can't get married is because their father has set an insane mahar. There are young brothers that are good religious working brothers that want to get married but they can't get married. And big fitan are coming in the ummah because of this. Things like homosexuality, things like yani, zina, things like uh, affairs with drivers and things like this. Big fitan. You know, as an ummah, we need to stop this kind of nonsense. Look, you want to get married? You know, if people come up to you, brother, I need a debt. Well, what's wrong? I need to get my daughter married. Why do you need money for that? Uh, tell the guy, come, this is my daughter. This, you want to get married to her? Khalas, go. You don't want to get me, you want a $100,000 wedding? Khalas, go marry somebody else. Why do you need to spend any, people spend a hundred grand, 60 grand. I mean, 30, 40,000 now has become a norm on a wedding. You're starting the poor guy and his wife off in debt. And then divorces. And then fights, and then problems? No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us a beautiful example. Thousand huh? dollars? Easy, man. Any, any, I think most people would be able to afford that. If you cannot lower it. Sharia didn't set that. Huh? If you really want to go a little bit higher, go a little bit higher. But, but what, what, uh, fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars? What, your daughter came from like Jannah or something? Does she come with three others? <laughs> That is ridiculous. And then the fitin happened in the ummah. So we need to go back to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes brothers, mashallah, just because they're wearing a big turban and have a big beard and all this, they think this is sunnah. But when you look at their actual lifestyle, there is no sunnah in it. No, we have to live, we have to walk the walk. Not just talk the talk. In our mu'amalat, in our dealings. Every one of us has shortcomings in akhlaq. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. But you should at least live by the sunnah then. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want to make a point here. If anybody's life, anybody in history, 
was scrutinized to the level that Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, his life is scrutinized alayhi salatu salam. Wallahi, I swear by Allah, I don't think anybody could stand up to that. Yani, every detail of his life is scrutinized. The earlier prophets are not. Like we don't have that type of detail about the day, daily routine of Isa ibn Maryam or Dawood or Suleiman alayhi salam. And they were prophets, we love them, we know they were great examples as well. But none of their life is documented like that of Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, if he wanted, he could have married a thousand women. Easily. Well, I mean, you know, don't look at me strange on that. Go pick up your Bibles. Go look at how many wives Sulaiman alayhi salam had in the Bible. How many wives Dawood alayhi salam had in the Bible, in the Old Testament. If you're Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're Muslim, go look up your documentations. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam could have had more than that. But look at the beautiful example. Every woman he married except for Aisha was already married. Many of them older than him. Many of them not even the same place at the time of the nikah. Why? Because his concern was for the ummah. Not for his desires. Or every household would have given their daughter in marriage to Rasulullah Younger. Anything he wanted, he would have had. But he didn't. Every marriage, because Allah ordained it. With the hikmah for this ummah. I want to mention a few. And there's just a few. Of the fawaid, of the benefits for this ummah. From the marriage of Aisha radiyanha to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa No doubt that the first thing, and this is what I'm going to focus on today is the preservation of the religion. See, people, they're short-sighted. People, they only see what's in front of them. People only think of what's their own benefit, or their own harm, or their own fears. They don't see the bigger picture. See, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa married Khatija radiyana, you know, and we talked about the age of Khatija radiyana, but no doubt Rasulullah was younger than her. And no doubt who's from the best of the, of the yani, lineage of the time. The Arab, they took Banu Hashim to be honored. And he was from the best of people. Sadiq, Lameen. But that marriage, even though she was older, she, were, she had already been married, she already had children. There was a benefit for the Ummah. That's why Allah chose it. Nobody criticizes that. <laughs> Right, but just in the same way there was a benefit for the Ummah in the marriage of Aisha radiyanha because she memorized the entire Qur'an from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam privately. And in the other Sahaba they memorized as well. We have many Sahaba that memorized the Qur'an, but she is the one that did it privately. There are times when Qur'an was revealed when she was the only one with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Yani, if that marriage had not taken place, that knowledge would have been lost for us. Because the Sahaba were not there in the private times. They would memorize from the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid. But they were not in the house. At times, they were there when the Qur'an was revealed. But at times, Aisha radiyanha was the only one. She said he would put his head on my lap and the wahi would come to him. And she would memorize it. And from the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, she is one that memorized the entire Qur'an. She memorized and reported 2,210 about unique ahadith. This is very important. Because sometimes we talk about uh, uh, imma and ulema later that memorized 100,000 ahadith or Imam Ahmad with a million ahadith. But that's with repetition. That means some of those ahadith have the same wording, but through different chains. These 2,210 ahadith are uniquely to her. Meaning that without repetition. Now some of those ahadith are also reported by other sahaba. But some of them are only reported through her. So that knowledge would have been lost. 
And as we know from the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, none even come close to her in the number of ahadith that are reported. Even amongst men, she is about the fourth of the highest memorizers. But no doubt, amongst Ummahat al Mu'mineen, she has the most ahadith that are reported. She is the one that preserved the fiqh of marriage more than anybody else. And if from those masail that are between a husband and wife, and I'm going to give some examples today from authentic sources. All these are sahih sources. She preserved that knowledge that when there were issues, questions that came about the fiqh of zawaj, yani of marriage, and nikah and the marital relations and so on, she was the number one person that, that Sahaba would go to. And many of those masail, she's unique that she's the only one that reported them. Now, it's very easy to make these claims. Any, and this is the thing, sometimes we have lecturers and they're very good at being emotional and getting you stirred up and they speak all nice. But, but that's not really the point I'm making here. I want to give you evidences. I want to give you references. So you know why we make these statements. Not just, okay, we can just say she was very humble. Yes, but where is that document? Where did we get that knowledge? This is a, a beautiful hadith. <coughs> and this hadith, and yeah, before coming here, I looked at the asanid, no doubt to it being authentic. It came in different books, and there are different asanid. Some asanid have weaknesses, but others that are strong clarify that this is uh, authentic narration. At the time of the death of Aisha Taradiyan, and this is something very interesting. People, especially those that were related to her or related to the Prophet ﷺ, they were coming to visit her at the time of her death. And one of those people was Abdullah ibn Abbas. Some of those people that, yani, because of their political and their filth and rafada, and they, they tried to criticize Aisha, radiyanha, but at the same time, they greatly praise Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu but they don't look at his own narrations about her about his praise of her so he used to constantly praise her and her knowledge and her ability and her suhud and her humbleness so at the time of her death when people were coming they said Abdullah ibn Abbas the nephew of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam and she's the wife of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam he has come to visit you she said don't let him in tell you why not because she didn't like him. Not because she was upset with him. She said, because he praises me. And he look at her. Uh, Subhanallah. Human nature is that everybody loves praise. You could deny it. <laughs> you know, some people have this, this uh, uh, fake humbleness. Wallah, it makes me mad. It makes me upset, you know. Like, if you are humble, it will show. Don't fake it. You know, some people, you shake hands. Salaam alaikum. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum, brother. What, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Shake hands like a man, what's wrong with you? you know? That's not humbleness. This is just, brother, how are you? <laughs> what's wrong with you? Stand like a man. Speak like a man. Walk like a man. You think Rasulullah, you know, when he would walk, he would walk with strength. As if he was leaning, that's how focused he was. Umar radiyan, when he would stand amongst people, would be towering above them. Abu Bakr radiyan, he was shuja and he was brave. Ali radiyan, and he, this was the true humble of this ummah. Not people that are like, hey, brother. You know, wallahi, I want to get myself canceled now. <sighs> Who cares? I saw a video, somebody sent me, of these brothers, and I'm not going to mention the name of the country, but there's a lot of people worshipping cows there. And these brothers were outside the masjid and these cow piss drinking, rat worshipping filth, they had these big whips, are these kind of like homemade whips. And they made these brothers stand in a row and they were whipping them. Bah! And these brothers were standing there. <laughs> bah! And one of those big amasajid, you know, had the maulid stuff on it and stuff. And they were whipping them. And these brothers were standing and brother, and somebody said, look at the Muslim. Wallahi, I was not angry at the Hindu. I was angry at the Muslim. What's wrong with you? What's the point of living? What's the point of being alive? If you don't 
have that much ghira, you can die. <laughs> That's not. Oh, they don't have gun. You can die. You can fight. Wallahi, if I have a, I have a toothpick, wallahi, I'll fight. Somebody disgraces me like that? Wallahi, why are you standing in front of a masjid? Well, why are you crying? What's that going to do? What are they going to kill you? They're going to kill your family? Okay. How many shuhada have we had in this ummah? You think the people of Afghanistan acted like that when the Russians and the British, and, you think it would be what it is? No. Oh, tangent. Aisha radiyanha, she allowed uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas to come. And he gave her the glad tidings. Subhanallah is beautiful. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhuma, the mufassir of the Quran. He said, everybody goes to whom they love and whom they're loved by. And he quoted the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al The person is with whom they love. And he said, you are beloved by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and you will be with them. Honey, what a beautiful glad tiding. Aisha radiyanha from her humbleness. Think about this point. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was buried in her house. Not in the masjid, in her house. Because that's where he died. And her father Abu Bakr radiyan was buried next to his sahib. Next to his companion, next to Rasulullah sallam. And the third spot was her haq. It was it's her house. <laughs> her father, her husband. Umar radiyan, he requests from her for that spot. I'm not going to take qasam. But I believe that if that was me, I wouldn't have given it up. The honor of being next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But look at her humbleness. She gave it up. She gave her her spot to Umar radiyan. And when it came close to her death, she said, don't bury me somewhere other than in Baqi. I don't want to be praised above the other wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I want to be buried next to them. Because I'm just one of them. I look at her humbleness. Aisha radiyanha from the Sahih Hadith when she would read Surah Al-Ahzab the ayat that had to do with the Ummahat Al-Mu'mineen she would cry so much that her khimar that the cloth on her head would get wet and not just cry but cry that much Qasim Ibn Muhammad Ibn Abi Bakr Qasim he is the son of Muhammad, who is the son of Abu Bakr. And he is her nephew. Obviously, Muhammad is her brother. He's mahram to her. So he would enter upon her. He mentions in a beautiful hadith, in a sahih hadith, he says, I saw my aunt Aisha radiyanha, that she would never leave Salatul Duha. And I'm not even talking about the fard. Today, we struggle with the fard salawat. To make it on time and to make it at its early time, we struggle. He said she never left it. So I asked her, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ever leave it? She said yes. At times he would be busy with the ummah and he would leave it. He said, what about you? She said, I'm not busy like him. So I would never leave it. Even though it's not fard, this is nafal. How many of us make Salat al-Duha every day? I don't. But look at her. She never left it. She, so he told her, will you never leave it? She said, even if my father Abu Bakr and my mother would be raised from the grave and they came out, I would not leave the salah. Nafal salah. He, she said, I would finish my salah and they would sit there until I was done and then I would speak to them. That is from her dedication to a nafal salah. Imagine her fard. Imagine her qiyam al-layl. The same Qasim ibn Muhammad Ibn Abi Bakr. He says, I came to my aunt when she was praying Nafal Salah. And she was reciting out loud. And I heard her repeating the ayat from Surah Tur. And she was repeating them over and over. So I sat there waiting for her to finish. She was crying and she was reading out loud and she was repeating the ayat. 
So I got tired of waiting, so I went out to go shop. I went out to the marketplace. He said, it went, I shopped, I did what I had to do, I ran my errands, I came back, she was still standing repeating the same ayat. SubhanAllah, this was her dedication to Salah and to the Qur'an. And these are actual narrations. My respected brothers and especially my respected sisters in Islam. My brothers and especially my sisters take note of these things. Her haya. She used to go for tawaf. Yani at times she would go with the Prophet ﷺ, but even after the death of Rasulullah ﷺ, she would go for tawaf, but she would try to go only in the night. She would go at night. Why? Even though she was covered head to toe. She would cover head to toe. As we know from Sahih Ahadid, Aisha she would cover her face. Even then she would go at night. She said, I like that nobody even sees my any outline when I make the tawaf. At once she went, in Sahih Hadith, she went to make tawaf and she saw that they had lit lamps. You know the little lamps? Because before there was no lamps. But then as the time progressed and the Ummah got technology, they put lamps. So she went to go make tawaf and she saw there were lamps, she asked them to be put out. Because she liked to make tawaf. No, at some time, you have to make tawaf in the daytime. You know, hajj and things like this. But when she could, she would prefer to make tawaf at night in the darkness of the night. Aisha radiyanha, al sahih hadith. Now imagine this time, because I want you to get context. At that time, the hajj and umrah was not crowded as it is today. At that time, the Hajj and Umrah was people were separate. People would go make tawaf on camels, and it would be families. Any or a person could go alone, and a man could go alone, or a woman could go alone. But at most times, if they went as a family, they would be in a little block. The husband, the wife, the children, those that are mahram would be together, and they would be making tawaf even on camels and horses and so on. And they would be away from everybody else. Yeah? Not like our time. At that time, a woman came to Aisha radiyanha and said, let's go, me and you, and kiss the black stone. Aisha radiyanha told her, you go. You go, because this is nafal. And if I brush up or walk against a man, and, he's in, and it, it, it happens that they brush against me, that's haram. So you go, because I'm not going to sacrifice my haya for something that's nafal. Well, imagine today, some of our sisters, may Allah forgive us, they jump into the crowd of men, pushing and shoving. And any, what happened to the fard? Aisha radiyanha, she used to teach. No, and this is very important today, because of the fitan we're facing. Some of our sisters are totally away from da'wah or teaching or benefiting. And that's wrong. We want our sisters to be involved in the da'wah, in, in ta'aleem, ta'allum, in durus, in halaqat. But some of our sisters in trying to do that, they have sacrificed their haya. Or they have, they have, they have crossed the boundaries of the sharia. And we cannot allow that. Aisha radiyanha, she taught. But she didn't teach because she was trying to be popular. She didn't teach because she wanted to flex her knowledge. She taught because she had unique knowledge that nobody else had. And that's important. Yeah. Sometimes she would know a hadith that nobody else knew. She knew fiqh masal that nobody else knew. So no doubt that knowledge needed to be shared with the umm. But she did so from behind a curtain. In fact, what is authentic is she would sit in her room. And there was a doorway between her room and the masjid. And she would put a curtain so that nobody could see inside. And she would narrate the ahadith. 
or she would give the fiqh rulings from behind that curtain. Today in our ummah, sometimes you see masajid where they'll bring a young woman at minimum with her face uncovered into the men's musalla. And they'll be sitting there giving dust to men. Billah. She's not our mother. Aisha Radina is our mother. Nobody could even marry her. She didn't go and sit in the member of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and give dars. She had knowledge that nobody has. I don't know any woman today that has knowledge that no man has. <laughs> I don't know why people are pushing. Is there some knowledge that a woman has that no sheikh, no alim, no mufassaran? But then to put her in that situation where she's sitting in front of men and men are looking at her and she's teaching in the men's musalla, where did they get this from? Aisha radiyanha, she has unique knowledge. She's the mother of the believers. She did not do that. Nobody would have stopped her. If she thought this was the right way, she would have done it. She, her house was had a wall with Masjid al-Nabawi. That is the member of her husband. But she didn't. She stayed in her house, behind the curtain, in her haya, and taught the necessary knowledge that she had to teach. She was a scholar, no doubt, of the Qur'an and of the Sunnah. She taught a hadith of the fara'id, of the mirath, of nasab, of tib, of fiqh. But she was not just a scholar, she was the one that they would go back to. The marja, she would be the one that they would go back, they would make ruju to her to know right from wrong. That's how deep her knowledge was. Men, when they disagreed, they would go to her. In the hadith that is muttafaqun alay, reported by Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Hurairah anhu, he mentions the hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that whoever attends the janazah they will have one qiraat of reward, and whoever stays until the person is buried will have two qiraat, which, as the hadith mentions, is like a mountain lord of reward. Another hadith mentions the size of Uhud and so on. Abu Hurairah reported this hadith. The hadith in Sahih Muslim, which is hadith number 945, depending on your print. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu narrates that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu was sitting and Khabbab radiallahu came and narrated this hadith from Abu Hurairah. He says Abu Hurairah radiallahu told us this hadith. Now, not every Sahabi heard every hadith. Right? Meaning, Sahaba, when they were around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa they heard a hadith. Sometimes other Sahaba would tell them a hadith. Some a hadith they didn't know. Right? So they would share that knowledge with each other. So Abdullah ibn Umar said that I heard the part about Janazah, but I didn't heard about this burial. Let's confirm what is right. So who did they use as an authority? Who did they go back to? Aisha radiyan. This is why the marriage of Aisha was so instrumental for this ummah. Here now, when Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu, one of the greatest narrators of hadith, one of the fuqaha of the sahaba, one of the Abdullahs that gave fatwa during the time of the Sahaba, one of the strictest on the Sunnah, when he doesn't know, who does he go to? Aisha Taradiyana. Look at that honor. Look at that sharf that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to her. And when Khabbab Radiyanhu was sent by Abdullah ibn Umar, as the Hadith Sahih Muslim, Aisha Taradiyana confirmed. She said, yes, I also heard this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abdullah ibn Umar marveled at that knowledge. And he said, we've lost so much reward. The hadith that Imam al nadawi has mentioned in his Sharh, Sahih Muslim, I found the Sanad itself, it's authentic narration, where the Sahaba and the major Sahaba, the senior Sahaba, the Kabir of the Sahaba, were sitting and they were discussing a mas'ala. Who was amongst them? Umar ibn Khattab. Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa. The, yani the, the one that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about his knowledge, the dream that he had. I mean, amazing Sahabi. Yani. He was sitting with them. And the senior Sahaba were sitting. And they discussed a mas'ala. It's a fiqh mas'ala that if there is marital relations, but it doesn't 
reach the point of yani, actual uh, ejaculation is ghusl wajib or not. So they discussed this masala. Some of them said, you know, it's not. And then some of them said, no, it is. Amr Radiyan said that you are from the senior. If you disagree, what will happen to the ummah? Yani, this is something beautiful about the Sahaba. They always wanted to bring ittihad in the ummah, unity in the ummah. So they would work things. They wouldn't just be like, okay, this is their madhab and this is their madhab and you can have your opinion and you can have your opinion. No, he said, let's fix it. So who would they go to? Who is the one that Amr and the major sahabas would go back to to get the fatwa to know what's right when we take mukhtalaf and hadith to bring together the, the narrations? Aisha. So go back to Aisha. Here, Abu Musa al-Ashari, the great Sahabi, he is chosen to go and ask this question. But the Sahaba had haya, yani, even though in the deen you have to ask these questions, and sometimes you have to know. So he went to Aisha and he said that, and I have a question that Umar has sent me with, and I can't refuse Umar, but I'm too shy to ask. She said, I'm your mother. And it's just like your own mother, you have a question you're going to ask, ask from behind the curtain. So he asked her, she said, yes, in the early time of Islam, it used to be that ghusl wasn't wujub in that situation. But as the ahkam came, Rasulullah sallallahu explained that when somebody sits in the four parts, then yes, it is wajib. And that is the correct opinion. She clarified the nasikh and munsukh because she was there with Rasulullah sallallahu in the house. And Abu Musa al-Ashri became happy, he took that knowledge back to Umar. And all of the Sahaba, the major Sahaba, they came to one opinion. Having seen the clear evidence preserved by Aisha Taradiyanha. Here I will stop. But I wanted to give these with references from authentic narrations. To show the debt we owe to Aisha Taradiyanha. From the wisdom of this marriage and from the benefits of this marriage. And from the debt the entire Ummah owes to Aisha Taradiyanha. And inshallah we'll continue in the next dars with her life and even the times of her life after the passing of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the great service she did for the Ummah.